morning, morning everyone. Um, noho mai, here mai, tene koto, tene koto, tene koto kato. Na mihi nui ki a koto kato. Warm greetings to everyone who is joining us, not only in New Zealand, but from across the globe. It is a pleasure to welcome you to the lecture of Dr. Hannah Hopewell as part of the Thinkers and Doers lecture series. My name is Bruno Marquez and I'm the program director for landscape architecture at Te Herenga Waka Victoria University of Wellington. So this lecture series aims at uh, bringing together practitioners, scholars, students and the wider community of landscape architecture and affiliated built environment disciplines to share and to hear the latest innovations in the field. Through an initiative between Tuya Pituara, New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects, Wellington Branch and the Landscape Architecture Program at Victoria University of Wellington, our objective is to bring nationally and internationally renowned experts. Our first speaker, uh, Dr. Hannah Hopewell, is a landscape architect, urban designer, educator, and poet with a background in professional practice. Currently, she is a lecturer at Wellington School of Architecture, and she also has completed a creative practice doctorate in special design titled Notes from the Urban Intertidal A Periontological Lean. The talk that she is about to present is the urban intertidal and other scopic apparatuses is a provocative presentation that draws on thought outside landscape architecture's genealogy and disciplinary ideals, asking what forms of seeing might proper under the idea of non-landscape. In the context of decoloniality, several experimental scopics are discussed and their significance to broadening critical modes of landscape practice. We will have at the end some time for questions, uh, but without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Hannah. Tina Koto Katoa, everyone. Hello to you all out there, and thank you for signing in and making the space of this session. Kia ora, thank you to the NZILA Wellington branch, uh, Nicole Thompson, for this invitation, and the Wellington School of Architecture, especially Bruno Marquez, for your excellent organisation. Uh, so to begin, now I'm a little clunky here, given I couldn't print anything, and I've got two computers in front of me and no mouse, so I'm a little, um, uh, yeah, uncomfortable, but uh, let, let's begin. So I'll just share my screen with you. Uh, all right. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, to begin. So the aim of this short presentation that um, Bruno has outlined is, is to introduce several experimental and radicalized ways of seeing that may provoke possibilities for fracturing the dominant modes of order regards to landscape visuality. As outlined, these approaches to seeing arise from my concern with a perennial issue, whereby landscape visualities, as both constitutively and currently mobilized and indeed naturalized, are on the one hand entangled in a Eurocentric universalism of image, and on the other, the marketization of the earth, and thus emblematic of various forms of violence we call colonization. Under such conditions, what is called for is more than new spatial imaginaries, but to reinvent new means of, of what it is to imagine. So motivation to depart from naturalized ways of seeing arose from where I find myself. <clears throat> quite plainly as part of the many forms of subtle and pronounced existence that make the world visible, yet also part of, of a machine that cuts and dices, denying the world full colour, a world where whiteness is so pervasive, rendered unseen and unspoken. It is a betwixt place, one that doesn't coherently fit into the firm shapes made to put things in, universal shapes like landscape architect or poet, 
In fact, I describe it as a non-place, quietly and slowly manifesting by way of a holding back, a turning away and a stepping over the confining lines of orthodoxy. Its non-place, however, is a founding, an idiosyncratic mode of transversal inquiry, conscious of the politic that it performs. Hence, alongside energies of many others who are concerned with the depoliticization of landscape practices, and recent as recent discourse has, has vigorously shown, this inquiry is a becoming aware of the multiple ways domination hides in the landscape to avoid getting tripped up by the cloaks of covert power. It thus improvises a practice under the rubric of decoloniality, one that acts on the hegemony in landscape's image of thought, decoupling from Eurocentric ambitions of modernity the style of scholarship taken has no interest in aiming its experimental scopic tools at anything other than a response to localized instances in which they're used. Hence, what I sketch here is not a counter practice. It has no sights on trumping or any form of generalized or reproducible application. Instead, my interest is in the condi conditions within which alternative ways of perceiving and representing landscape can emerge, enter into discussion, build understandings that both contest the totalizing claims and political epistemic violence of modernity, while being agentic to the creation and performance of new relational shapes of seeing. By introduction, these apparatus or scopic technologies, the ways of seeing and thus thinking, are not governed by the spatial codes and linear temporalization of modernity. Nor do they emerge from the episteme of the pre-moderns or the indigenous, but are improvised by a strand of non-standard thinking in convergence with what has been come to known as a general ecology, or ecology unbound from the moderns idea of nature. That is alongside the physical practice of encountering the urban landscape. So whilst not adhering to a prescribed field as such, the project is a speculative form of realism, insofar it explores ways of conceiving the urban landscape, the human independently of its relationship to, the cog to cognitive forms or phenomenology. I've used these ways of seeing in a writing practice I named parafictioning, a type of field poetics or sight writing of the everyday urban landscapes of late capitalism. But before I, um, I move to that piece of work, I firstly want to um, speak to the problem in regards to seminal landscape visuality to reinforce the deep entanglement of landscape and wielding forms of trauma. So it's well established that landscape and power are constitutively related in such a way that is central to the colonial control and classification of space, land and people. Landscape as an image is critical to this bearing. In fact, as James Corner states, landscape and image is inseparable. Without image, there is no such thing as landscape, only unmediated environment. The politic thus lies in what kind of image, what kind of image of thought is deployed. It is because of the role of landscape visuality and the political imaginary we should continue to explore its continued visual construction. Paul Carter points out <clears throat> the modern concept of landscape emerges as a key rhetorical term in the vocabulary of unprecedented internal as well as external colonization, thus honing subjectivity whilst extending and appropriating physical territories. This, the landscape way of seeing, the landscape image therefore, brings with it more than just spatial code, as it sutures epistemological authority to power and renders this association naturalized within the cosmology of the moderns. Modernity, as Bruno Latour reminds us, means to lose the experience of relations, thereby asserting acts of division, cut, and carving out categorizations of the discrete, spheres to separate out the viewer from the view, the subject from the object, the future from the past, the human from the non-human, the individual from the collective. Such binaries are set within a default narrative of progression and vision of linear timekeeping as fuel for domination and exclusion, charging epistemological authority against other ways of knowing and being, such as the blind spot of whiteness. 
Similarly, Dennis Cosgrove referencing Alan Burgess' term <clears throat> articulates landscape as a way of seeing, a composition and structuring of the world so that it may be appropriated by a detached individual spectator and structuring of the world so it may be, sorry, to whom an illusion of order and control is offered through the composition of space according to certain geometries. Landscape, he writes, distances us from the world in critical ways, defining a particular relationship with nature and those who appear in nature. It complements the real power humans exert over land as property, while seemingly aligned to individualistic self-actualization. W.J.T. Mitchell and Landscape and, and Power reinforces the westernness of landscape, its modernity and its visual pictorial essence, and further that the rise and development of landscape was a symptom of rise and development of capitalism. The harmony sought in landscape read as compensation for screening off acts of violence penetrated there. The historical narratives landscapes generate a tailor made for the discourse of imperialism, he writes, whereby an expansion of landscape is understood as an inevitable progress development in history, an expansion of culture and civilization into a nature space and a progress that is itself narrated as natural. Thus, landscape becomes the medium to express extension, outwardness, and space in a way as, as a way of moving forward in time. The prospect that opens up is not just a spatial one but a projected future of development and exploitation. Like imperialism itself, landscape becomes a representational practice reflecting how cultures could imagine their wealthy destiny in an unbound prospect of endless appropriation and conquest. I suggest vestiges of this constitutive landscape image are today still active. Of course, landscape practice is no, lo no longer rests entirely, nor is it so seduced by the pictorial as contemplative. <clears throat> we now have also the prevalence of the time image and the relational image. In summary, landscape architecture has witnessed a significant and critically influential shift in representational intentions in the last 20 years, mainly in resistance to the scenic. For example, James Corner's eclectic mappings, the temporalization of complexity demonstrated in many of the down through Park 2006 competition, ecologics of process and forms of periodization such as phonology, along with embodied practices, practices that are more relational, engaged with how landscapes are produced and lived. In fact, we've seen the arrival of the non-representational image and des design practice as engagements with happenings and events. I anticipate there will be significant critique to come of the ecologic image and its smoothing of neoliberal moves. However, is the constitutive landscape practice still active? Does this perspective continue to assert a hallucinated, or does perspective itself rather, continue to assert a hallucinated spatial truth, a, a realistic image despite the absence of a viewer? Don't we still speak to the theatre of foreground and background? Does the promise of prospect drive the privileging and marketization of views or organize how recreation trails are marked out Therefore, how the earth, and along with it, the urban subject, is curated. So let's consider the horizon as a projective imagery in which the landscape image is complicit. The horizon, according to anthropologist Elizabeth Provenelli, is vital to liberalism's toxic and continued inhabitation of the earth. Horizons are open, they shift, <clears throat> we enter them, and they in turn move with us. They deploy a spatial imaginary to bracket all forms of violence incurred as a result of unintended and unfortunate unfoldings of late modernity's own dialectic. In this way, the law of the horizon keeps the real from ever landing. It allows the effacement, the forgetting, the minimizing of ongoing land traumas with, a, with an assumed normative orientation and speculative rule of, sorry, specific rule of law. It is the horizon that forges the vicious absorption of entire worlds into their regimes of capitalism with an apology that should have been that it should have been done more gently with more cultural and social sensitivity. It is the horizon that allows the nerve to be given cultural and social values uh, such as Matara Māori, but at the same time policies 
polices rather anything that will be actually actually threaten the skeleton principle which gives the body of law its shape and internal consistency. It is the horizon that I ambitioned to unsee. So what is it to think the urban landscape without these relic scopics imposing their clandestine entanglements? No prospect, no perspective, no horizon, or in fact without the assumed consent to be a single individual. From where, therefore, if not myself, am I suggesting one does their scene? This is the speculative project, some of my recent work is provisionally intended, and to which I will now turn. As a cautionary, it's likely you will find aspects of my practice ch challenged for comprehension. It is perhaps disorientating, estranging, using ways of seeing unrecognizable, the image of thought not quite graspable, possibly offering very little relevance to your established practices of engaging with a landscape image. <clears throat> I forewarn this terrain in which this provisional work occurs, builds on its, its non-placelessness and is best described as a non-landscape, not a loci in opposition, counterpart to or, fault to a fault or false to the real landscape, but an idea alongside, coexistent or on a different plane. That is, in its difference, it, is another name for landscape, unbound from modernity's binary-based suppositions and epistemological scopic drives. In this sense, non-place, no, sorry, non-landscape is not landscape, not, is not landscape's other. In advance, I thank you for bearing with me and allowing this transdisciplinary and rather fringe scholarship to trial its performative thought within the landscape frame. As I mentioned, this research theoretically emerges as a post-human variant from a convergence of general ecology, that is ecology without nature, and non-standard theory. I will bypass explaining this cobbled context other than to name the thought of Francois L'Oreal very influential. What follows outlines a little of how the scopics are uh, operationally availed and sketch how the urban intertidal and the stranger, as I call them, are, con excuse me, are constructed. The urban intertidal and the stranger are non-human scopics formed in superposition with the urban landscape. As a non-representational practice, the screen, but I hope not your mind, is free of image. <clears throat> so the, the primary um, operation of this work is called the non. The non is coming from L'Oreal's non-standard and is the catalyzing agent offering a sidestepping of governing orders that promulgate the ruling motifs of urban and landscape discourse. It is the key methodological feature affording thought to radicalize or to shift into superposition. I do not think about the non, but with it, and significantly it offers new experiences of thought. It brings an aberrant modal operation, a practice, a material behavior. The non acts positively, making tools of thought physical. It renovates terms as they are lived, bypassing functional signification at the level of the signifier. Thinking with this non becomes part of the real, rather than becoming understood as representations of it. My writing practice of parafictioning uses this non in forming distinct bodies with urban waterfront landscapes. The non is not concerned with exerting overt oppositional uh, force. In fact, there is no dialectical movement. For example, non-landscape is not landscape's other, nor non-human is human's other. The second um, kind of operation I'll introduce is superposition. So superposition names the uh, proxy of position. It offers a place for the experience of thought, one where the enduring binaries of modernity and its linear temporality cannot take hold, where the normative means of the human as an individuated knowing subject and soliciting subject bears no meaning. It creates a new world in the, in the right here now. The term superposition comes from quantum physics and references the real existence of all quantum states as they are superposed. Superposition outlines this methodological outlines a methodological analog analogizing gesture of a non-aesthetics, a fiction by which thinking itself becomes an embodied material participation and not a representational mode of the true or the false. Following the logic of superposition, past, present, and future, exist as an effect to time, to issue a flowing thickness of a futurial now. 
So with brevity, I want to emphasize that despite the labor of these technical operations, the orientation of this work is geared towards a subtle texture of encounter with the everyday landscape as most broadly construed. So the first of these scopics I call the urban intertidal. And this is focused on sustaining ways of seeing time alternatively to capital time. It names the clone of the tide and locates recursive temporality folded into the urban everyday. It attunes to the generic rhythm or temporal economy of movement. And in this way, the urban intertidal moves without a boundary, but with a guiding edge that's always, in the last instance, showing up a circulation that cannot hold, like a time machine removed from any inflationary time. The urban intertidal flows as a non-space, a vacuity that can never be filled, becoming a performative scopic technology for composing as if from everywhere, yet without invoking any sense whatsoever of interiority or exteriority. By analogy, my impetus for involving this technology is to use it somewhat like a non-human and ambitor um, walking kind of mechanism in much the same way as urban research during the 20th century adopted the walker as the city's means of plural perspective. Urban intertidal is also a scopic technology for focusing non-event or non-ground or non-place territory within a realm of the urban that I call non-human. It is also a way of constituting a movement that resists axial extension, resists accumulative possession, and that doesn't see the point of the city, but feels its pressures. Here, <clears throat> I use this urban intertidal for defining contour, including moments altogether eluding any particularity of a moment's content. In other words, the urban intertidal composes time along with the technicity that not only allows time to go both ways, but as well permits the static, the suspended, to have the sense of everyday finitude. The time of the urban intertidal is thus pervading, yet derealized, and different to, yet enduring, alongside the urban or world time. The urban intertidal clones tide dynamics to amplify a texture, it's like a weave of reading between gesture and geometry, of incomplete time. The incomplete expresses a fourfold of recursive same difference that seems to move inexorably through imperceptibility, through a gradient. As a diagram, it makes a non-representative chamber whose boundary skin is constantly renewed. Like a turning wheel, it is without density, yet forms an energetic technology. Though the urban intertidal equally engages the notion of material or the flux of thought, it occurs in waves and particles it operates on a composi compositional principle resistant to the dissection seal, a bit like, a, like the surging sea. Hence the urban intertidal is a minimum generic probability graph and it maps the structural pattern of whatever is passing without exacting content. The neutral and personal inflection points to this singularity are potentiating in a recursive series under the fourfold of the incompletion of time. There is no notion of fragmenting, there is no, as, as no total is assumed. Instead, it's assumed oscillation. So this fourfold is ebb, suspension, flood, retention, and it's an incompletion of time, time as a generic materiality without there being essence to time. The urban intertidal attempts to encounter a seeing of free form thought outside time of the present, capital time, that can of its own accords begin again for the first time making a sort of tabula rasa of time. Ebb and flood operate as energetic forces of drag and push in this recursive series. Crucial in this regard is the inclusion of suspension and retention, imperceptible immobile points where the vulnerability of common finitude is included at every unseen turn. This scopic is inherently focused on the virtuality of space and time in ways that are generic to locality. The second of um, these apparatus, the stranger. The scopic, scopic op orientates towards generic humanity, the undivided multiple, the very identity of all relation. To see with what I named stranger in the context of this research is to see the inalienable of urban living, a dimension foreclosed to worldly representation or recognition. Yet to inhabit this seeing practice in urban landscapes, an act of cloning is necessary. 
analogous in method to the use of the tide in the intertidal, here I use the figure of the stranger as a clone of non-standard generic humanity. It opens seeing to that dimension of the pre-subjective, the pre-lingual human, a quality of non-humanness without recourse to a philosoph philosophy of being. This clone, radicalization of the urban subject in the last instant, is used as a scopic technology for encountering the lived without figure or figuration as inscribed representation. It affords ways into a territory that includes the human, yet is beyond its discrete bounds. This method then, resi sorry, sorry to interrupt you, are your slides stuck? No, no, they're definitely okay. not. <laughs> yeah, thank you okay. for asking. Sorry, go, a go ahead then. It, it, it will become, I think, obvious near the end why, why it's blank. <laughs> uh, so where was I? It affords ways into its territory that include the human, yet is beyond its discrete bounds. This method resists the prevailing and normalizing dyad within urban discourse of stranger and citizen and gives effect to unilateral encounter with the real as the lived, as the only basis for identity. This diffuse seeing based on species, gender, ethnicity, and so on, and thus sees without division, without categorization. This cloning, of an effect of the real gives space to the stranger as subject in the last instance, inhabiting a radically a radical solitary and fundamentally vulnerable real to complicate the urban's prevailing categories of individuated forms. To see with the stranger is not thereby to attempt to represent it, but allows its mutations to afford a host of alternative post-human images of a living city. The scope it works through, letting it remain strange, when the human is free of the meaningful, not to become meaningless, but to become singular and non-identical. Now there's much I could say about how these scopics move my experience of encountering urban landscapes, uh, <clears throat> and along with how non-landscape offer one such possible route to reinvent the means of what it is to imagine new relational shapes of seeing. Yet instead, instead I will conclude with a piece of field poetics and look forward to taking some questions. Just a moment. Okay, excuse me. Move that up. Okay, this um, is just one, one piece that's selected out from a range of the parafictioning works that have been undertaken through these different scopics. Blacking in the spaces of turn, foam traces flatness of grey green, delimiting the contour of harbour and hold. This tone, a bridge where possibly time, a gesture, a plain demand, fulfilling the call of another world, an act, an appeal, a waiata, meeting the response happening, a preemptive prior, foreclosing speed smother, nearing leisure's lassitudes, bearing a resonance not lost, but resounding unheard and ill-fitting. Foam, the loose time of invitation and inlet, where spheres of shine pop, where cessation burrowed, propelling bivalves under lateral compression to swell to fluidize sediment, we're pr probing in pairs, Toria whose scarlet beaks point upon an opening in turn, a veranda of cool airs, wafting boundless out of everywhere, with you, nobody, everybody, arriving again, already there, saltation layering weighted in fluids where your own solutions linger. Shifting across gradients in a drift shown by the moon, asking where does dissolve as proceeding, go still, remote, a sentence incomplete, inclining a question, prompting incursion with an already place, so elsewhere glints like a fancy, born under a fake sun, and clothing to catch the rising just to flatten, to shield its gliding between moon's wanes, breaking the confines of a line, a close circle, a thought sliding out, guiding an edge of slow motion, overflow, sharing, and receipt of a rhythm of farewell, Taking up slackening and rockless sway, stalks helicloner and sheen glades luster, floating held up in curvature minor, absorbing the sky's coat to sow a blanket of skin so porous, scars of burrow and crack spit the sound of decay in circumference the sewer speaks, to whom does not follow, such directing into the drain of darkening soils, where the gullies and vents let a gap between breath brimming with flesh saturated pores, marking out the involuted edges of echo, whilst it was otherwise quiet, 
back flow accords, a reactive crystalline of crevices coagulating under the burning reprieve of gas release. With no more remainder at this blackening, the line arcing wraps itself parallel, resting ruination from the valence of the nest, appealing to an elsewhere, holding unaccustomed death as eerie annihilation, as if for the first time, this instance, abandoning terrestrialism for an unplaced temporal buckling to proffer where not appearance surfacing thalassic succeeds the painted pony, spinning its rear to the swelling like the leaves turning, like the gutter brushes circling with a steady pour of anonymous and unmeasurable body of your body akin to a static hanging bond, honing dedication to each instance of ambient curling freedom understood itself not comprehensible. Subtracting, subtracting the waves, the one path with no shadows stretches lightly lapping at the intentions of the horizonless city. We're sloosing the surface of the image where the stopping keeps going, the grain of thinning beach calls out hoarsely under finite stars. What remains unspoken, unless you're it of the days didn't knowings, a nulling weight in floating cargoes whose trickles at no time down, a June dispatching shop life, shimmerings defaulted delivery systems, mark out a stop time eventing, a local intimacy unzoned, shaped in itself, senseless, skimming in monochrome, an elastic frontier petitioning, not at re-enchantment, but for a landscape out of sync, contoured without a severed headland, a hollow land with no view, to ask, what does thought have to become? So I'm going to end my uh, presentation there, and I hope to, um, to take some questions and uh, fill you in a little on um, some of the background of some of those scopics. So, um, yeah, please. Thank you, Hannah, very much for that. Uh, for sure, it kind of took us to a different type of landscape. Uh, <laughs> I'm very happy now to open to anyone who is willing to pose a question to Hannah. Do not forget to unmute yourself before doing so. Rod. Hi, Hannah. It's Barnett here. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. So, Hannah, um, I love the poem. Or part, I mean, I, I wonder, and I wonder what uh, the part of me that loves the poem loves about the poem. Um, and that makes me ask you a question about the mediation that you find the image involved in on a kind of... Uh, constant and uh, uh, power-driven way. If we're going to critique the image, where does that leave us with the word? Um, itself a mediating condition. So, I mean, uh, you seem to be using words in a way that you are able uh, to get at your interests. Um, but uh, don't, don't words come with all their practices of whiteness and horror too? Yeah, but what else have we got? <laughs> so, I mean, in some regards, this particular inquiry could have taken a, a not used words and used a diagrammatic or, or used kind of different form of image making why I've taken up words, the, the truth of the matter is, is probably I do find a certain seduction um, in the medium of poetry, and, and that might be in contrary to some of the things I'm attempting to, to claim. So I can't help but continue to, to operate in the sort of world I've been educated and so forth in. So I think it's a um, Staying with the, with the you know prevailing tools we have to a certain extent, but then re reframing how they can be used. If that makes any sense. Yeah, I'm not going to. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. But the the interesting thing for me about the contrast between word and image is that um, the word usually has uh, some uh, origin in a particular linguistic uh, culture and. So we have this thing we call translation, uh, and I'm not sure how that operates 
you know, yeah. and like and, uh, and the image. So I'm not going to go on go on about yeah, it. But I think, I, I, I think mean, that's, I understand your question a bit better now, and in, in, in the sense that um, that's what exactly this project tries to do is to um, cut that 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 form of assumed translation off at its knees, um, and um, rather than using the naturalized or default um, you know ways of knowing to rest into these these forms of uh, so I'm calling them scopic apparatus to use those as as proxy so there is a there's a form of translation taking place of course um, but it shows itself in a very different way okay so we're always working with proxy yeah well cloning I call it mm. yeah got it thank you <laughs> thank you Rod I think our next question is from Becky Kiggle Oh, kia ora, Hannah. Thank you. Kia ora. I, I won't turn my camera on because I'm still in my pyjamas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, um, yeah, just thank you for that. That was really, really interesting. Um, I guess just to follow on from Rod's question, um, I wonder, and, and, and it was sparked a bit by you um, not changing the slide for a long time, actually. <laughs> and I wonder if... Um, if you'd thought about not writing things down because you know there's the kind of there's sort of um words in terms of kind of verbal or oral um communication methods and then there's words in terms of stuff that's written on the page and you know just thinking thinking about maori traditions and how you know mm -hmm. knowledge meaning was conveyed orally um i don't know just you not yeah you no, not, that's a really nice thing to think about actually i mean um, I guess the medium of, of a, this kind of poetics, uh, I don't even really like calling it poetry, but the sort of word that I use in the creative practice is meant to be a spoken word. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I can, I guess, and I hope this doesn't appear to be a cop out, but it, the, this work was developed in, you know, as an academic, in an academic environment. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not to say I couldn't have engaged in some other speaking practices, of course. Uh, but no, that, that, that gives me something to think about actually. For sure. Yeah, in a way, um, I guess what you're saying is I'm, st I'm still maintaining a, a kind of tradition uh, of one that I'm actually trying to resist. So there's a poss possibly a um, contradiction there. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, there's a, there's a um, First Nations architect in, in Canada who, um, who kind of subverts writing in another way by um, whenever he writes, he doesn't use use kind of traditional punctuation in English so he, he uses no capital letters he uses full stops or anything like that so there may also be other ways of kind of mm. reframing the written word as well potentially mm. yeah the, 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 the piece of poetics that I show today is not like any other in fact as they emerge they're all different um, so it's not like I've got any sort of conventions or rules around how the sure. word is supposed to uh, be elaborated. In fact, um, I speak about it as words without language, so without the formality of um, what we perceive as to be comprehensible language around it, and the mm. words uh, emerge through their encounters and engagements through these scopics and in sort of real places. So that's that's the kind of um, background to that, this particular project. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Hannah, I think I have a question for you. Um, sure. How how much of these has informed your thinking and your practice as a landscape architect? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, this has been, my inquiry in this kind of quite difficult space has been going on quite a while. And in the first instance, it's actually stopped me designing. So one reason why I withdrew from active design practice is because I felt I was participating in, um, uh, occurrences that I would have rather, rather not and that's mm. absolutely no criticism of, of anyone at all but I was wanting to kind of find new ways of framing things um, mm. so it, it has shifted my practice quite dramatically and it, it's a continuum and I, I find it quite difficult to answer that directly but mm. and in a more um, in a more specific way it's made me see the landscape really differently Mm. Most definitely, and and it focused my attention on things that um, 
perhaps are just passing so mm -hmm. on on time a lot more and and less needing to kind of formalize and put things in in, in categorizations and so on it's it's enabled me to kind of um see the complexity in new ways right thank you for that any other questions from our audience our very international audience <laughs> Nicole. Thanks, Bruno. Hi, Hannah. Thank you. That was fascinating. Um, I'm imagining that because I don't really have an academic brain, quite a bit of that needs to be digested by me a bit more <laughs> thoroughly before I can fully um, understand everything that uh, was being said. But I do think that we need a new way of thinking about landscape and not, not just in New Zealand, but um, globally in terms of how we appreciate it and bring it back to my own experience as a landscape architect here in Wellington. Uh, we're faced with a resource consent process that, or RMA framework that puts a lot of value in the image, in the scene of landscape and how other things might sit within it or upon it. And I think coming at it from a different direction is something that could be really useful to us as practicing landscape architects to not be so mesmerized by the image and what that image might contain. I think we have to go deeper than that. And your work, um, the I'm going to call it a poem. I don't know if that's appropriate, but um, that starts to help us, I think, delve deeper beyond the scene and to understand the processes that are involved. So thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I, I mean, it's, this is sort of related also to what Bruno asked. I have been thinking quite a bit about landscape ac assessment practices um, recently and have been just reading a, a bunch of them. Um, and I'm finding I've got a kind of a slightly uh, renewed sense of uh, critical faculty around um, you know some of the conventions that are employed there and how they do appear to be um, quite out of step with I think how maybe designers are kind of taking up the landscape so I mean that's related to a whole lot of conventions around RMA and so on um, but I think there is some work to be done there that that, that possibly um, this or a version of this things I've been thinking about might be able to um, to, to kind of uh, uh, you know assist in yeah, or at least have some opinions on. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Nicole. Well, I think um, uh, beyond everything else, I know that um, I'll be thinking about this for some time. So uh, am I right in thinking this is recorded and we can dip in and out of this oh, talk yeah. when and as we choose? You are absolutely correct. <laughs> okay, final question. Peter, you raise your hand. Yeah, unmute yourself. Can't hear you, Peter. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still getting used to Zoom. Um, yeah, it's, um, hi, Hannah um, and everyone else. Um, uh, nice to see a few people I haven't seen for a while. Uh, um, so with, um, uh, I, I must say, I, I think I need to look at a text version of what you're saying uh, and or really listen to the video. But I, I got the feeling that, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but um, does your idea of image always, is it always something that mediates? Um, I, I, I'm not really claiming that I've got a particular idea of image. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just experimenting with some things. So it's not like I'm coming out here, you know, coming with this work and, and forming a, a kind of a conclusive body um, or opinion. Um, I've, I've basically uh, honed a sort of new way of formulating thought and then taking that into a, into a writing practice to, to consider um, new ways of seeing. Um, they always, but I, but I do think, um, you know, mediation and translation, as we said before, there, there is always something at play. Yeah. Um, I guess there's also something kind of powerful about, I um, mean, the idea of an image, not 
being like a, um, a cultural frame or something or some sort of filter, but something that, that's a, a reaction. Uh, and so an image is also something that hits you and um, that you're joined to and has consequences and things. So it, it can, I mean, I certainly agree with Nicole and you about uh, the you know, issues of uh, new, new, needing new ways of looking at landscape and issues of power and things like that. And but that, there's, yeah, so I'm just curious because I'm, you know, I'm always interested in the power of representation or the power of action or thought or whatever. Um, and uh, if, yeah, so if it's sort of ha how to not have, you know, how to not just see things as a mediated thing. So I'm just mm. curious as what to what your thoughts were about that and quite happy to keep talking yeah. with you about it at some stage. Yeah, sure. It, it's, it's like um, for me in this work that, um, the let's let's use a convention. The internal image versus the external image has no boundary, and that an image forms a shape, and that that shape actually is also thought. So in a way, I am exchanging thought and image in a way that um, is probably quite unconventional. So I mean, mean, it sounds like uh, you're, yeah. I mean, you're exploring words and other things, and so they're they're um, trying to connect in some way beyond um, the cliches, I suppose. Um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 uh, I, I feel sympathy for what you're doing. <laughs> so, but yeah, it'd be good to discuss a bit of, you know, non-mediating sort of ways of engaging, which I think yeah. we always, we are actually always doing um, mm -hmm. in, in the landscape or whatever, mm -hmm. and in the designing, and, and I think designing, um, you know that's one of the real challenges of landscape because landscape um, is so prone to being sucked into uh, the imaging you know the sort of um, mm. the disconnection from that sort of thing the disconnection from images which are actually not mediating yeah um, i understand mm. yeah. and if there is many people asking in the chat box where they can read your work or find your work oh well i have to get myself organized and um put it on the uh, academic.com or whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Beyond the not, academic not really platforms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so okay, um, I, will update, I will update my, um, my web page on the VUW website. Yeah. What I can do is that I can send you the mailing list of people that registered for this talk and you can always send them and, sure. you know, some, something to read. Okay, thank you everyone for attending uh, this early breakfast talk. Um, I think it was quite successful. And just a reminder that uh, in two weeks from now, we're going to continue. And there is Tim Waterman, Associate Professor from Bartlett School of Architecture in London. Um, thank you, Hannah. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us from literally across the globe. I'm seeing names here of people I know from Argentina to uh, Africa to, you know, Europe. Like, it's just amazing to see how everyone is connected. And Perfect. yeah, thank you. thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.